Welcome to our audience members joining from around the world. I hope you're staying safe and healthy. My name is Panit Talwar, and I'm a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute. Thank you for joining us in our latest installment in a series titled, The Coronavirus, Asia, and the World. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Ambassador Dan Shapiro for what promises to be a stimulating conversation on Israel's response to the coronavirus, Israeli politics, and its foreign policy. Ambassador Shapiro is a distinguished visiting fellow at Tel Aviv University's Institute of National Security Studies. He's also an accomplished diplomat. He joins us today from Israel, where he served as the American ambassador under President Obama from the summer of 2011 to early 2017. And prior to that, he was a senior director for the Middle East and North Africa at the National Security Council, where he and I were colleagues. In both of his roles in the Obama administration, Dan excelled, not only because of his deft handling of some of the most complex international issues, but also because of his diplomatic skills and his personal touch. In Yiddish, he would be aptly called a mensch. So, Mr. Ambassador, Dan, if I may, thank you for taking the time to join us today. We have a lot to cover, so let me ask you a few questions to get us started. Um, and I'd also like to invite our audience members to submit questions using the chat function on Zoom. I'd like to first ask about the situation uh, with the coronavirus in Israel. From the outside, it, it seems as if Israel has the situation successfully under control and that Israel is actually in that place that we all hope to get to, which is the other side of the curve. It acted very early and today it only reported 38 cases. I'm sorry, that was as of yesterday. The country has uh, already started to reopen, and uh, I just want to ask you if you could give us an overall sense of the impact of the virus and the government's response. Sure. Thanks, Puneet. It's great to be with you and great to be with the Asia Society and the Policy Institute and all your, your members and supporters. Uh, I don't know if that's the first time Yiddish has been used on an Asia Society uh, broadcast, but uh, if it uh, is the first, uh, I'm delighted and, and very delighted the, about the attention being paid to the western part of Asia uh, where I'm sitting today. Uh, you're absolutely right in your summary that uh, Israel did respond very early. Uh, they shut down international travel largely uh, by requiring a 14-day uh, quarantine of any uh, Israeli or foreigner who had arrived, so it pretty much shut down all business and tourism travel. Uh, already in the second week of March, uh, they strictly enforced uh, closures, especially through uh, the April holidays. Uh, on the scale of Israel with one international airport, a population that's used to following security orders from their uh, government during times usually of military conflict, uh, a fairly high quality, if at times overburdened healthcare system, uh, they really, I think, uh, do deserve uh, to be ranked among the more successful countries uh, in how they have uh, handled the outbreak. The outbreak has, has been kept in check. Uh, it peaked right around April 1st and has been steadily uh, dropping since then. A total of about 16,000 cases uh, at its peak, about 800 a day, but as you mentioned, uh, down to 20 or 30 a day in, in recent days. About 237 deaths uh, uh, and uh, never a sense that the uh, hospitals were being overwhelmed or that they didn't have the, enough uh, equipment to handle uh, or the capacity, they had excess capacity of ventilators. Um, and I think that's uh, uh, a, 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 there has been over the course of this, uh, of this pandemic, a general sense among the public that it, the uh, government was handling the crisis with competence, uh, was expanding uh, the testing that was available, was using uh, surveillance tools, including uh, uh, those established largely for terrorist tracing and used by their uh, their Shin Bet Security Service to do contract tracing of those who had been uh, uh, who had been infected or those who had been exposed to those who were infected. Enforcement of quarantines um, and overall, uh, the public handled it in a fairly calm uh, manner. Uh, there were divisions on display at times between the health and the economic professionals about how strict the uh, the closures could be. Uh, but overall, uh, on the health side, I think Israelis are giving their government fairly high marks and are looking forward to the next phase, which is a gradual, uh, cautious, uh, phased reopening, uh, obviously with the ability always to uh, revert to more strict closures if that's required. The big job ahead, of course, will be the economic recovery. 25% uh, of Israelis have filed to uh, receive unemployment benefits. 
many small businesses are in significant stress. Uh, it's not clear they will be able to survive or reopen. There uh, are plans for the finance ministry to put uh, to, to provide significant aid to businesses and, and workers under stress, but those have been stalled by the uh, long uh, drawn out government formation period and the real packages really won't be delivered until uh, a government is formed. But to this point, I have to say, uh, I think Israelis feel that uh, they have come through the worst of it. Uh, certainly hope so. The, the infection rate and death rate is, is roughly half of what it was in the United States. Uh, and uh, people are feeling reasonably optimistic about the next phase. Great. Well, thanks for the overview. Um, can I ask you um, which sectors of Israeli society um, have been hit hardest by the by the pandemic, and and uh, what are the implications of that of, of, of that sort of impact on uh, social cohesion in Israel? You know, Israel is a, a much more diverse society than it is often uh, recognized, uh, and there are two particular groups in society that uh, lag behind economically uh, and often educationally, uh, and in terms of broader integration <clears throat> into the public into public life and into the high tech sector. Uh, of which Israel is very proud and which is very prominent. And those are the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish sector, those who wear the traditional garbs and live the very strict uh, religious lifestyles uh, and generally live in uh, self-contained communities, neighborhoods within cities or even whole cities that are uh, very much uh, devoted to their communities. And the uh, Israeli Arab sector, these are uh, Arabs, uh, often Palestinian origin, uh, Arabs, uh, Muslims and Christians. Uh, who also tend to live in uh, self-contained communities, especially villages in the north and in the south where it's a more Bedouin community, and then some neighborhoods of, of, of larger cities as well. And like in many societies, including in the United States, uh, it's not uh, surprising that uh, those who live in the uh, more marginalized, uh, more underserved, uh, maybe less educated communities tend to suffer uh, worse when uh, these kinds of uh, tragedies strike. Uh, and indeed, that was very much the case in the, particularly in the, it really was noticeable in the first three or four weeks of the crisis in March in the ultra-Orthodox community. Uh, this is a community that tends, in a way, to self-isolate. They don't largely consume mainstream media. Uh, that's not where they get their information. They get it from their own uh, religious-sponsored uh, uh, news outlets. Uh, there is some mistrust of uh, broader government authorities. Uh, there's a great reliance on the authority of rabbinic figures uh, who themselves are uh, very focused on internal community matters and religious matters, much more so than national matters. Uh, and they were therefore slower to embrace some of the uh, restrictions on communal activity that were really necessary to prevent the spread of the violence. There's a heavy emphasis in those communities on, uh, uh, on large events, uh, communal study, prayer, uh, weddings, and the like. Uh, and they tend also to live in poor and very crowded uh, communities. So in particular, there was a city, B'nai Brak, it's a suburb of Tel Aviv, which is almost exclusively ultra-Orthodox, which was probably hit the hardest. Uh, it was so bad that the government at one point felt they really had to seal off that city. Nobody could come or go uh, for a period of a week or two. The army was brought in to provide food and, uh, and care for the, for the residents. Um, and uh, at its height uh, of the outbreak, about one third of uh, Israelis who had been uh, diagnosed and tested positive for coronavirus were ultra Orthodox. And that's out of a population that's roughly 12 percent of the overall. So you can see how hard how hard hit they were. Even the health minister who himself, uh, Yaakov Litzman, represents a party uh, from that sector, was infected uh, with coronavirus. He seems to have recovered. Um, eventually, though, in dialogue with the uh, government, uh, they began to adopt the, uh, the, the social distancing restrictions. There actually was a, quite a bit of appreciation for the Army's role in coming into that community to provide for the public's needs, uh, where there has at times been tension uh, between those communities and the Army because they generally don't serve in the military. Um, at the same time, there were some societal tensions. You could see, read in commentaries uh, some Israelis blaming that community for uh, making it harder for the society as a whole to flatten the curve. You could feel within those societies a feeling of being blamed as if they were being targeted and, and, and uh, scapegoated uh, for, the, uh, for the virus itself. So both opportunities for greater understanding and some integration and also uh, some, uh, uh, some friction as well. And a similar phenomenon within the Arab communities. 
uh, the Arab communities initially uh, seeing somewhat more isolated geographically saw less prominence of the outbreak, uh, but it did arrive and there remain, even as the overall infection rate has gone down, hotspots in, in a handful of Arab towns in the northern, uh, northern Israel. Again, these are kind of chronically underfunded, underserved communities whose health sectors lag behind uh, the national. At the same time, uh, Arab Israelis have been very prominent, very successful within as health as professionals within the healthcare sector. Something like 25% of Israeli Arabs and doctors are uh, Arab Israeli uh, of Israeli Arab and doctors are uh, Arab citizens of Israel, and 50% of pharmacists uh, are are Arab citizens of Israel. So the, there was a, a conscious effort put forth uh, by many in the health sector, some in the government to highlight the contribution uh, that this community was making to the overall fight that many patients in uh, Israel's most prominent hospitals were being treated uh, by uh, Arab doctors and nurses. Uh, so on the one hand, there was uh, an opportunity for that sort of sense of, of solidarity and integration. On the other hand, it coincided with a period when the uh, main party that represents the Arab communities of Israel, the Joint Arab List, was which had uh, cast its votes and then recommended uh, Benny Gantz for uh, the prime ministership was being uh, uh, described as an unworthy coalition partner in any uh, Israeli government. So uh, again, opportunities for integration and greater understanding and solidarity in uh, tension uh, with some political frictions at the exact same time. Great. Well, along similar lines, um, you know, I noticed that the uh, UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, uh, Nikolay uh, um, Mladenov, has praised cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians uh, on the coronavirus. I wanted to ask if you could talk to us a little bit about what you've seen of, in terms of the impact of the virus in Palestinian areas um, and on cooperation uh, between, um, uh, between Israel and, and the Palestinians. It's been uh, well, among the best examples of cooperation between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and even in a quieter way between Israel and the Hamas authorities in Gaza. Uh, there's obviously been very deep concern about uh, uh, these communities, again, which uh, certainly lag behind economically and in terms of the quality of their health infrastructure, that there could be a massive outbreak, particularly in Gaza, which is such a densely populated uh, uh, part of the world. Uh, of course, their isolation also uh, contributed to the later arrival of the virus. There's much less international travel in and out of those communities. And in a way, it's remarkable that there still remains uh, no mass outbreak or no evidence of a mass out outbreak either in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, undoubtedly, uh, they uh, are undercounting because they don't have widespread testing capabilities. Uh, but there are no patients currently on ventilators in the West Bank. There's only about 345 current cases uh, in the West Bank and uh, 170 in East Jerusalem and uh, mere dozens uh, in Gaza, where when the first cases did arrive and were diagnosed, they were immediately sent to uh, quarantine uh, facilities. And uh, it appears that the virus has been kept out of the main population. Um, uh, and in, during the same period, uh, there were uh, numerous examples of Israel and the Palestinian Authority uh, 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 health uh, ministers uh, in uh, the West Bank uh, uh, working together to provide testing equipment, to provide uh, uh, protective equipment for, uh, for doctors and, and medical professionals, to provide other medical equipment to facilitate the arrival of international uh, aid as well. And the same uh, process, uh, again, conducted much more quietly uh, between Israel and Hamas authorities in Gaza, even the uh, uh, the uh, ability of some Gaza doctors, uh, obviously only with permission of Hamas authorities, to come into Israel uh, and receive training um, from Arab doctors in Israel that they could then take back with them uh, into Gaza. Uh, in, as you mentioned, the UN uh, representative here, uh, Nikolai Mladenov, uh, praised all three parties, Israel, the PA, uh, and Hamas authorities, for putting a public health crisis uh, above uh, the political disputes that usually divide them, uh, and in a way fencing it off from that politics. It wasn't completely absent. There were some ugly charges aired uh, by the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, Mohammed Shdaya, that uh, IDF soldiers were intentionally uh, spreading the disease among uh, Palestinians. There was no evidence of that, uh, and uh, that was very early in the crisis and hasn't really been repeated, at least that I've heard. Um, but uh, I think much more so this crisis has been characterized by the kind of cooperation that 
uh, is needed when trying to deal with a public health matter as uh, exactly that, not as a political dispute. Even in the Jerusalem municipality, uh, the mayor, who's considered a right-wing mayor, uh, not at all interested in Palestinian aspirations uh, in East Jerusalem, has received high marks for his cooperation with East Jerusalem community leaders uh, uh, to help them uh, manage their caseloads and to begin to lift the, the closure restrictions there as well. So it's been a, a, a relative success story. One shouldn't assume that this solves or erases or prevents uh, political disputes or even security uh, crises, which uh, are, I'm sure we'll get to uh, in a few moments. Uh, but uh, one has to say that at least until now, uh, those three parties have handled this uh, crisis in a, in a professional and fairly non-political way. Great. Um, can I ask you, um, you, you hinted a little bit at, at the, uh, the political drama that uh, uh, Israel's been uh, undergoing for the past uh, 15 months plus. Um, it seems like the pandemic has uh, brought that to an end or is about to bring that to an end. Um, and I just wanted to ask if you could talk to us a little bit about this, uh, this coalition agreement between the Blue and White Party uh, and Likud um, and uh, uh, how we can expect the deal to play out uh, in the months to come? What are the kinds of things we need to watch for? There's no question that uh, coronavirus shaped the political outcomes following the most recent election, the one on March 2nd, which was the third in this series of three elections. Uh, the main opposition party, uh, Blue and White, led by Benny Gantz, the former Israeli uh, Defense Forces Chief of Staff, uh, and his colleagues, they had sworn never to sit in a government under Netanyahu as prime minister because of the indictments pending against Netanyahu for bribery and breach of trust and fraud. Uh, his trial was scheduled to start on March 17th. Uh, and although Likud did better in this third election than they had done in the previous one, and they were the largest party, uh, Netanyahu did not have a majority uh, to form a government. Of course, neither did Gantz. Gantz uh, had 61 recommendations, 61 as a majority in the Knesset, 61 recommendations to receive the mandate to form a government, but he didn't have uh, enough in, uh, cohesion among those 61 to form a government. Uh, and so uh, he had pl what he planned to do was use the period following the election when he received that mandate to put pressure uh, on Netanyahu. Uh, the plan was to uh, install a Knesset speaker from uh, the Blue and White Party who would advance legislation that would say uh, a prime minister uh, or person under indictment as Netanyahu is, cannot serve as the prime minister, and to impose term limits uh, on uh, the office of prime minister. Netanyahu is seeking his, his fifth term as prime minister. Uh, and to use that pressure on him to get him either to leave or to be pushed out by his own party or accept to be second in a rotation agreement if there were a unity government, uh, and to do that while he was on trial. Uh, and of course, Netanyahu was determined to use every uh, bit of leverage that he had to try to find a way out of that uh, a trap and, and to try to remain prime minister. Then the coronavirus uh, outbreak uh, arrived. And I would say it had three effects on this uh, political situation. The first was that it enabled Netanyahu or his justice minister, who's an acting justice minister uh, and a crony of his, uh, to uh, delay his trial. It was scheduled to start March 17th. On March 15th, the government announced the first of the, uh, the, of the strict closures of public, many public activities, and lo and behold, that included the courts. Uh, and only hours before a long-awaited trial on these very serious charges, the trial was postponed two months. So that meant that the negotiations about the government did not have to take place in the shadow of Netanyahu sitting in the defendant's bench uh, uh, in, the, in the courtroom. The second effect was that uh, Benny Gantz, the head of Blue and White, really clearly began to feel the, pro the pressure uh, of, and the national responsibility uh, to bring the country together in a unity government to deal with the crisis. He, of course, is not a career politician. He spent his career in the military. He believes deeply in public service and in, in doing uh, what is right for the public. And he clearly felt, uh, and it was uh, obviously a, a feeling that Netanyahu did a lot to generate, uh, that this was an emergency, that the public couldn't, uh, it needed to be addressed in real time, it needed to be addressed with consensus solutions, and the public needed to be spared being put through a f potential fourth election during the pandemic, and he felt that pressure. And the third effect was that Netanyahu saw, uh, and the whole country saw, that Netanyahu's approval ratings began to rise post-election. Why did that happen? 
much like President Trump in the uh, several weeks after uh, the formation of the Coronavirus Task Force in the United States, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu held a nightly press conference. He dominated the briefings. He provided information. He provided reassurance. He explained the risks and, uh, and the measures that would be taken. Uh, and for the most part, uh, he received high marks from the public uh, about handling this uh, crisis professionally. And polls began to show that if indeed uh, this uh, political stalemate led to a fourth election, Netanyahu would have a good chance to win that fourth election outright, unlike the previous three, and be able to form a government on his own without any input from blue and white, perhaps pass legislation in that government to give him immunity from all of his, uh, all of his legal uh, charges. So in, under those three conditions, uh, Gantz changed direction and he decided to go into a unity deal uh, with, uh, with Likud. Uh, in doing so, he split his party uh, almost down the middle. Uh, there were two, there were four prominent leaders of the blue and white party. He uh, and another former chief of staff, Gabi Ashkenazi, decided they should join the government for the purposes of unity and preventing a fourth election and addressing the coronavirus. And the other two leaders, uh, uh, Moshe Yalon and uh, Yair Lapid, two ministers who had previously served in Netanyahu's governments and don't trust him and uh, really have not overcome their uh, aversion to serving in a government uh, with him under indictment. Uh, they refused to join. And in splitting his party, Gantz sacrificed a lot of his leverage. It meant he was going into the negotiation with Netanyahu with much, many reduced numbers instead of essentially uh, equivalent numbers of the two blocks. He went in with about a third uh, of the strength that Netanyahu did. You know, when we think about unintended or unexpected uh, uh, implications of events far away, a, a, a prominent Israeli journalist, Amit Segal, I think captured it very nicely in a tweet right when after Gantz made this decision to uh, split his party and join a union government, he said, you know, about four or five months ago, somebody in China might have uh, eaten a bat in a wet market. Uh, and five months later, a political party in Israel collapsed uh, and broke apart and it led to a unity government. This is hard to know how uh, distant uh, uh, events can, uh, can affect politics in, a, in another part of the world. But it's clear that coronavirus was the major factor uh, in uh, the breakthrough of this political crisis. Now, the government has still not been formed yet. They formed a very convoluted uh, agreement uh, that would allow uh, an 18-month rotation, first with Netanyahu serving as prime minister, and Gantz as something like uh, something called alternate prime minister, a position that's never existed before, and then in 18 months for them to uh, switch places. Uh, there's serious question about whether Netanyahu would uh, adhere to that deal and he would have many opportunities to wriggle out of it, uh, either call a new election or reshuffle the government in some other way. And it's not clear Gantz will ever get his turn with 18 months, but that is the structure of the deal. Uh, despite the in disparity in the numbers, uh, the deal does provide for equality of the numbers of ministers in both, uh, uh, for, for both sides of the, uh, of, the, of the partnership. And uh, that will give uh, Gantz and Blue and White a fair amount of influence. It's really an essential show over legislation and over appointments, and you all have the same uh, essential veto. Um, but it's, so it, it promises to be a very uh, cumbersome and perhaps stalemated government uh, uh, for much of the time. They've agreed that in the first six months, uh, the only matters this government will address are coronavirus emergency related uh, measures, whether health or economic, uh, with one exception, which I'm sure we'll get to, which is the issue of annexation in the West Bank. And Blue and White uh, was able to uh, wrest control of the Justice Ministry, uh, which they believe will help ensure that Netanyahu's trial, which is now scheduled to start on May 24th, uh, is not further delayed. So that Netanyahu will actually go to trial while being a sitting prime minister. That's the basic structure of the deal. It's not a final. The Supreme Court in the last two days has been hearing uh, uh, challenges to first the question of whether Netanyahu may serve as or may form a government at all while he is uh, under indictment. It is largely expected that they will uh, not prevent him from doing that. But there are a number of other uh, changes to the basic law of government that uh, enable that very convoluted uh, structure, which uh, have also been challenged, which the, the justices yesterday expressed a lot of skepticism about. The Likud has been saying that if the Supreme Court forces them to reopen this agreement or change any aspect of it, they will go to a fourth election uh, immediately. Uh, that this was a very, uh, a very delicate house of cards that was constructed. And if you remove one brick, the whole uh, edifice collapses. 
But there's another uh, factor in that. Netanyahu, uh, again, has seen that he has gained a great deal of approval uh, from the public for his handling of coronavirus. He has now split the main opposition party. It no longer exists as a unified party. It's not likely to come back together uh, before another election. Last night, he held a, a very uh, uh, a press conference, which one might have called a victory lap, basically describing Israel's success, uh, certainly relative success uh, compared to many other countries in handling coronavirus and announcing the beginnings of the, of the gradual reopening. Uh, and uh, he must be tempted. He must be tempted by the idea that if indeed that he had a reason to pull out of the agreement, which limits his power, because of equal, equal number of ministers, because of the 18-month rotation, uh, because of allowing his trial to go forward, he might be able to do better uh, in a fourth election, which is now would now be only two or three months away. People might see him as uh, having earned another term. He might even be in a position to be with a, a unified cabinet that would pass legislation to give him immunity uh, from his charges. So it's not a done deal that this unity government that has been uh, this convoluted unity government that's been agreed to will be established. We'll know all of this in the next two weeks or so. Wow. Well, it's never a dull moment over there. Um, it, you mentioned the trial. Uh, how much of a spectacle and a distraction is this going to be? How, how long do you expect it to play out? Uh, and and will, it, you know, will it impact um, Netanyahu's ability to govern? He has demonstrated a uh, ability to wriggle almost Houdini-like out of very tight spots. Uh, and he seems to have done that yet again. First of all, he has a very loyal base. Uh, it's not a majority, uh, but it is enough that uh, Likud is uh, con consistently in uh, the position of being the largest or at least tied for being the largest party. Uh, and they have largely stuck with him even uh, through uh, very serious uh, charges of corruption. He has uh, described the, uh, the whole legal case against him as a witch hunt. These will sound like very familiar terms to, to Americans uh, who have followed our politics uh, and a kind of jihad by the uh, legal establishment and by the media and by uh, left-wing politicians. And many of his supporters uh, agree with that characterization. He has held together uh, not just his own party, but a coalition of other right-wing and religious parties who stood with him through these three elections and, and never wavered as, as acting as a block. Uh, and that meant that, that Gantz was prevented from uh, finding a coalition that he could use to challenge him. Um, he, I think, has believes that if he's under trial while prime minister, he will very much be able to help shape the perceptions uh, of that trial. Uh, he will have the tools of being prime minister to say certain days he's engaged in affairs of state, traveling overseas, dealing with security matters, can't be in court. Uh, he will uh, certainly be able to accentuate the idea that he is uh, uh, being persecuted for political reasons rather than for legal reasons. Um, and uh, he seems to believe that he has a good chance to uh, either uh, uh, be acquitted or at least to drag this out through some other uh, turn of the political wheel, maybe another election, uh, which could uh, further uh, his case that he has made, that the public already knows what he's been suspected of, and they have chosen him again and again. They haven't exactly chosen him, not by majorities. He didn't get a majority, but a significant number, and certainly you could say a bare majority in the Knesset have, have chosen him uh, to be prime minister. So we will uh, see the, the, the trial itself could last, frankly, it could last years. Uh, if he goes through a full trial with all the abilities uh, that he'll have to delay and make motions and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and use all the procedural tools at his disposal, undoubtedly the first trial would take a year plus. And uh, the law says that once serving as prime minister, the question at the table of the court yesterday was, could he form a government as prime minister while indicted? But there's no question that a prime minister who is under indictment can continue to serve. And um, until the final appeal is exhausted. Uh, and in the Israeli legal system, I think we can predict that uh, to actually go through a trial, if he's convicted, go through appeals, and there would be at least two rounds of appeals, is probably a three to four year long process. Uh, that's uh, almost certainly going to have an, uh, another election happen in that period before a final outcome. So he has, I think, a, a good chance to stretch this out uh, and uh, either beat the charges or arrive at a, or he hopes anyway, to arrive at a more favorable political situation 
when he'll be able to use other tools uh, to wriggle out from. Well, the saga will continue. Um, you hinted at this uh, earlier in terms of the um, the the components of the, the the coalition agreement that seems to be receiving the uh, uh, the most attention, um, and that's with respect to uh, the, the a, a provision which allows um, the government, starting on July first, to to bring a bill before the Knesset, uh, which would enable annexation or the extension of Israeli uh, law over parts of the West Bank. Um, and there's a big qualifier, uh, that is if there is American support for the move. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you could help us um, understand this provision, what do we need to know about it? Um, and what are the possible scenarios um, and how this plays out in the months ahead? Sure, so in the end of, the end of January, President Trump issued his uh, plan for peace, uh, peace to prosperity, I believe he called it, between Israelis and Palestinians. And it, for the first time, uh, adopted the terminology of a two-state solution. That was something President Trump had not previously adopted. Uh, but that's really a name only. What it describes is a, uh, an outcome in which Israel would annex roughly 30% of the West Bank, the Jordan Valley, and all is Israeli settlements throughout the West Bank, uh, not just those uh, in the large blocks close to the Green Line, the former 1967 lines, but really including those distributed uh, widely uh, throughout the West Bank. And Palestinians, if they were to negotiate and if they were to meet a number of very strict conditions, would have the opportunity to form a state with extremely limited authorities on a somewhat disconnected, uh, non-contiguous uh, series parcels of land uh, totaling about 70% of the West Bank. This, of course, was rejected immediately by the Palestinians. Uh, there's no chance any Palestinian leadership will negotiate on this basis, at least not in the foreseeable future. Um, and then the Trump administration signaled that uh, Israel, uh, if Israel chose, uh, in the absence of Palestinian negotiations, to uh, annex the 30 percent that the plan envisioned Israel keeping, uh, the United States would recognize that. And what was required was an Israeli-American joint mapping process to determine uh, which uh, areas Israel, Israel would keep. And they began that process. They appointed a committee anyway uh, to begin that process just before the Israeli election and just before the world turned upside down. Uh, with annexation. That's kind of where things were left at the, at the, at the beginning of March. Um, what the coalition agreement says is that as of July 1st, and this is the only non-coronavirus issue that can come up in the first six months of the government, Prime Minister Netanyahu could bring on his own, without agreement from Gantz, uh, to the cabinet or to the Knesset a vote to uh, annex uh, 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 territories in the West Bank. And the only other condition, as you mentioned, is that it have the approval of uh, the United States. So that puts pressure on uh, if this uh, government is formed, of course, we're still waiting to see if that happens. That will put pressure on uh, the new Israeli government and the Trump administration to complete this joint mapping process. Um, and there will be a number of other factors that will go into this. Uh, first of all, uh, nobody from this defense establishment has really had a chance to raise their voice within the government uh, debate on the wisdom uh, of doing a unilateral annexation of the West Bank. It's, quite widely known that most uh, leaders within the IDF, most leaders within Israel's other uh, intelligence and security agencies are not enthusiastic about unilateral uh, annexation of the West Bank, not enthusiastic about uh, extending Israeli control uh, in deep into areas that are, are largely uh, populated by Palestinians, uh, not enthusiastic about putting pressure on Israel's relationship with Jordan and its peace treaty with Jordan, uh, and perhaps uh, some of its relationships with its other Arab neighbors, Egypt and, and Gulf states, uh, by taking this step. Uh, Gantz, who will serve as defense minister while he's in his alternate prime minister role, and Gabi Ashkenazi, the other former chief of staff, who will serve as foreign minister, will have an opportunity in those internal uh, government debates to at least bring the perspective of uh, the Israeli security establishment uh, to, uh, to this annexation debate. Uh, they, this security establishment has been influential in the past. In fact, when Gantz was chief of staff, he and other uh, security chiefs were very strongly opposed to a unilateral Israeli strike on Iran's nuclear facilities, which was being considered in the 2011-2012 period, uh, and were influential, maybe not determinative, but certainly influential in the outcome of that debate, meaning that the, the strike was not conducted. So those voices will be heard. Certainly, there's a chance that uh, Jordan, well, I don't think there's a chance. I think we know that Jordan 
will voice strong opposition to unilateral uh, Israeli annexation in the Jordan Valley and in other parts of the West Bank. It relinquished its own claim to the West Bank in the 1980s, but has never wavered from its support for a, a Palestinian state uh, to emerge and uh, on the basically on the former 67 lines and with a large Palestinian population in Jordan that's a point of real sensitivity for the king. Um, Gulf states at least have joined Arab League statements uh, calling uh, for annexation not to occur. How hard they will push that uh, agenda, it's hard to know. Uh, but there, again, those voices will be heard. Now, the Palestinians, of course, already strongly come out against unilateral annexation. And, and even today, President Abbas has renewed threats that he would cancel existing agreements with Israel on security cooperation. This could affect, of course, the ability to confront terror groups. But maybe in a day like, uh, in a period like the one we're in, it could, at least in theory, affect their ability to cooperate on health concerns and other economic concerns. Uh, those threats have been made many, many times before, and they're largely dismissed as, as in Israelis' ears because they don't really believe Palestinians would, would do something that is self-destructive to their own uh, economic and security interests. But uh, those voices will be heard. And then, of course, there's the factor of the American election. If uh, Netanyahu looks at this question in July and he has to sort through all of these different uh, uh, oppositional or, or, or challenging uh, views that are expressed, uh, it's not clear if he will act on July 1st, certainly a thing uh, that the decision could stretch through July, through August, into the fall. Uh, and he also has to uh, grapple with the fact that while President Trump has said he would recognize these areas, uh, Vice President Biden has voiced opposition to unilateral annexation. Pretty much all Democrats in the uh, U.S., uh, elected Democrats in, uh, in the United States uh, Congress have also uh, expressed opposition to unilateral uh, annexation. And so he has to grapple with the question, what would it mean to reach this decision in agreement with the Trump administration if a uh, successor administration only a few weeks or months later uh, would hold a very different view about it. And there's one final, I think, very complicating factor for uh, the Israeli, internal Israeli debate on what to annex. While the plan allows Israel to annex 30 uh, percent, no one has drawn a map that says exactly what that 30 percent would be. Uh, uh, when they actually get around to looking at that map, you'll need a lot of input from security professionals. The IDF will have views on how can you protect isolated settlements? What kind of corridors do you need to reach them? Uh, as those maps are drawn, uh, the lines tend to swell and the amounts of territory implicated in them tend to grow. As settler communities advocate, and many of them will have influential politicians in their corner, uh, they will say, uh, you know, we don't want to just define our territory that's annexed by the built up area of our community or where the fence line is. There's another hilltop. There's a municipal master plan that uh, enables that we envision uh, our settlement being two or three times its current footprint. Um, and we'd like to annex that territory as well. There are 128 individual uh, settlements in the West Bank. Each one of those will be uh, lobbying for uh, its lines to be drawn in an expansive way. And I just think it will add a lot of time. It will be a very complicated internal debate, uh, which uh, in aggregate, uh, all of those uh, attempts to uh, expand the lines could push the numbers well above 30%. And that could make it much harder to reach agreement between Israel and the Trump administration. So I'm not at all sure this is going to happen immediately on July 1st. I think there's a very good chance that all of these various factors will uh, delay the decision in the Israeli government, uh, at least through the summer and perhaps into the fall. And then uh, the decision really is implicated by the uh, proximity of the U.S. election. So uh, it really remains to be seen whether this is, uh, this is coming down the tracks quite as fast, fast as it sometimes feels like it would be. Personally, I'm uh, very much concerned about it. I've written and, and spoken uh, against the idea of unilateral annexation. I do think it uh, poses a very, very significant uh, uh, dangers uh, to the prospects of a two-state solution uh, ever being formed. Uh, it would uh, 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 potentially uh, lead to the Palestinian Authority, perhaps not immediately, but when President Abbas leaves the scene, uh, really eroding its capability to govern. Uh, Israel might find itself pulled back into uh, the main Palestinian population, population areas on the West Bank. And then it faces these kind of insoluble uh, dilemmas of how it can be both a Jewish and a democratic state, while controlling the entire population and territory between the Jordan River uh, and the Mediterranean, which is large, basically uh, equal uh, or nearly equal uh, Jewish and Arab populations. Many younger Palestinians 
uh, already have given up the hope of two states. They uh, argue that uh, their future would be better served by a one state reality in which there are equal rights, the right to vote, the right to participate in national elections uh, for all people who live between the Jordan River uh, and the Mediterranean. That's definitely a recipe for a binational state, not a Jewish state or, or otherwise not a democratic state. Um, and that I think, uh, if, if that's the scenario that uh, unilateral annexation leads to, uh, that becomes a very difficult uh, uh, proposition for much of the international community to resist. And even there are supporters of Israel uh, in the United States who would find that to be a compelling argument. And I think that really threatens to weaken the bipartisan, bipartisan consensus around the U.S.-Israel uh, relationship and uh, over time could actually uh, uh, weaken the U.S.-Israel security partnership, which is something that is of great value to the United States as well as to Israel, uh, and it would be very damaging to our interests to see, to see weakened. So I'm hopeful that uh, this uh, annexation story can be uh, uh, delayed uh, past the election, and uh, perhaps uh, the Israeli government will rethink the wisdom of it uh, in, in, in light of a different, uh, a different administration. I think that's really a comprehensive understanding of a incredibly um, uh, potentially consequential move um, by the Israeli government. Um, let me turn uh, for, for the last question. I wanted to just get your sense of, of, of turning your attention to the region, if we might. Um, you know, the, the virus hasn't really diminished the, the simmering conflicts uh, on Israel's uh, uh, doorstep, uh, and uh, the most acute one, of course, is the uh, the Israeli-Iranian uh, low-level conflict. And uh, in fact, reports in the last day or two suggest that um, Israel even carried out uh, a couple of strikes uh, over the past uh, 24, 36 hours, um, uh, and uh, maybe six or seven uh, in the past two weeks. Um, so um, I wanted to ask you uh, about um, you know, the, the possibility for those tensions to, to boil over uh, into uh, into conflict, particularly as it relates to uh, Hezbollah, which is very uh, closely aligned with with Iran. Um, do, could you address that for us a bit? Sure. Most Israelis, uh, from the public to the prime minister and, and all of the security professionals uh, in between, would likely describe their uh, top three security concerns as Iran, Iran, and Iran. Uh, they really view Iran as their overall uh, adversary, security uh, part, uh, challenger, uh, the, the party that on its own and through proxies uh, sponsors the most uh, uh, present and the most dangerous uh, pro uh, possible or potential uh, threats to Israel. Uh, and so this is of constant, uh, uh, there's constant vigilance around these issues. One, one area of that, of course, is the Iran uh, nuclear file. Uh, as it's well known, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was uh, an opponent of the uh, Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal that President Obama signed in 2015. He spoke against it uh, in the U.S. Congress, um, and he favored President Trump's decision to uh, withdraw from it and to uh, impose maximum pressure sanctions uh, on Iran. Um, and uh, while he favors that, uh, he has yet to describe exactly what Israel's uh, answer is to the dilemma that it poses, which is that uh, because Iran, in response to the U.S. withdrawal from uh, the agreement uh, and the reimposition of sanctions, has begun to diminish its adherence to its own uh, commitments in the JCPOA, uh, the Iran uh, nuclear program is advancing, and its breakout time is now uh, shorter than it was under the deal. Under the deal, Iran was kept at least at a year distance from a nuclear weapon uh, today, most estimates have it uh, close to half of that, six, five, six, seven months uh, distance as well. Now, in, during the Obama administration, when uh, Iran seemed to be uh, at uh, close proximity to that breakout capability, at various times, I mentioned one period during 2011 and 12, uh, Israel made clear that it was not ruling out its own military option uh, to uh, strike Iranian nuclear facilities. Uh, you don't hear that threat being made right now. I don't think it's uh, conceivable that Israel could launch such a strike against uh, Iran uh, without a full endorsement by the Trump administration. And the Trump administration seems committed to trying to use its maximum uh, pressure sanctions to do something. I'm not sure whether it's bring Iran to the table or whether it's to cause a collapse of the Iranian regime. 
but neither of them has quite addressed this dilemma uh, that uh, uh, Iran is actually closer to a nuclear weapon than it was uh, under under the deal. Uh, but I don't see much prospect of an outbreak of uh, of conflict uh, by uh, uh, a direct Israeli intervention on the nuclear uh, on the nuclear uh, program. Where there is some potential, although I think um, a manageable amount of potential is in uh, relates to Iran's uh, regional role. Israel's approach to this uh, threat, which is uh, manifested with Hezbollah, Iran's main proxy in southern Lebanon, uh, and with uh, Iran's determination to use Syrian territory because of its uh, support for the Assad regime and the civil war there to embed Iranian uh, military troops, Shia militia, uh, missiles, drones, and other equipment. Uh, Israel's approach has been to conduct what it calls the war between the wars. Uh, it tries with a very low signature and without a lot of publicity uh, to conduct a regular, a regular campaign. Some of it we hear about when we hear about strikes, airstrikes, which Israel often doesn't take credit for, but are usually uh, and probably correctly attributed to the Israeli Air Force on uh, military facilities in Syria where there are Iranian or Iranian uh, proxy uh, uh, station. Um, as well as uh, other means of uh, infiltrating these, uh, uh, these Iranian and Iranian-sponsored activities in Syria. Um, and uh, to degrade Iran's capability to threaten Israel from Syria, uh, and it has done that. Uh, hundreds of strikes have been conducted, perhaps even over a thousand. Some acknowledge, some not. Um, Israel has been able to conduct this campaign because it's reached some very effective understandings. Uh, with Russia, uh, the uh, predominant power in certainly in terms of airspace in in uh, in uh, in Syria, um, and uh, uh, that has uh, helped them conduct their campaign to try to keep their uh, the most dangerous Iranian threats, whether it's drones or whether it's precision guided missiles from uh, that could overwhelm Israel's missile defense uh, capabilities from uh, being stationed in Syria. The risk of this, of course, is uh, low because Israel is very professional about how it conducts these affairs, but it's not zero because it's only as good as uh, uh, not having any mishaps or any accidents. Uh, Israel did have one incident about a year and a half ago where an Israeli plane was struck by uh, Syrian air defenses. It managed to get back into Israeli territory. It crashed, but the pilots survived. Uh, had that plane gone down in Syria or in Lebanon, had those pilots been killed or captured, uh, undoubtedly, it would have uh, in, in, uh, led to a very strong Israeli response and probably a more escalatory kind of situation. There was a border incident two or three years earlier in 2015 in which two Israeli soldiers were killed. It was dumb luck that only two and not 12 were killed. Had a larger number of Israeli soldiers been killed, that also could have sparked uh, a larger, uh, larger conflict. And there's this worry about precision guidance missiles, which mostly are, have been shipped in from Iran. But if uh, they were being manufactured domestically in Lebanon. Israel, which generally hasn't struck in Lebanon, might feel the need to do so, which could engender a Hezbollah response and then an escalation. So uh, there is not a zero probability of conflict. There is a, a strong feeling by all sides that nobody wants this conflict right now. Iran under economic pressure and COVID-19 pressure, uh, Hezbollah managing internal affairs in Lebanon, and Israel very happy to conduct this war between the wars. But there is always risk. Thanks, Mr. Ambassador. Well, that's an incredibly rich presentation. We, we've, we've really covered the waterfront. Um, before I close our meeting, I'd like to let the uh, members of our audience know that uh, our next event will be this Thursday, May 7th, uh, when my uh, colleague, uh, Danny Russell, will host a meeting entitled Sanctions and Pathogens. How is COVID-19 affecting North Korea? Uh, it promises to be a fascinating discussion, and I uh, encourage all of you to tune into that. So in closing, um, Mr. Ambassador Dan, let me thank you again for taking the time to uh, be with us today and uh, to, again, really giving us a, a rich flavor of, of all of the issues and, and challenges and opportunities that, uh, that are before Israel right now. Your insights have been really valuable. And uh, to our audience, uh, we wish you good health. And uh, please remember, we're all in this together. My thanks to the Asia Society and uh, to you, Puneet. Thank you. Thanks.